When I started writing poems for people on the street, at markets and festivals about eight years ago, I really wasn't sure what to expect. I had heard about some people doing this out in California, and I thought to myself, you know, I should give that a try. The basic setup looks like this. A couple of chairs, a table, an umbrella to keep the sun off, a typewriter, of course. My favorite typewriters are Smith Coronas from the late 1950s, early 60s. My sign says, poems. Any topic, typed while you wait or walk around, pay whatever you choose. People come up to me with an idea or a concept, the thing they want the poem to be about, and then we have a little conversation. Sometimes they give me a little information, sometimes they give me a lot of information. If I feel like I need something else, I'll ask a couple questions to get me pointed in the right direction. When I feel like I have enough, I get to work. I can usually type up a poem in about 10 minutes. If I'm not particularly busy, the people will just have a seat right there, wait for me to finish. More often than not, though, they'll walk around, see what else the market or festival has to offer, and then come back later. When they do, they get a mini poetry reading right there on the spot, and then the poem is theirs to keep. Sometimes I take a picture, but most of the time I just hand the poem over and I'll probably never see that poem ever again. What I wasn't sure of, though, is what kind of requests I would get for topics. I thought I'd write a lot of poems about special occasions, birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, things like that, and I do write plenty of those. I also thought I'd get a lot of requests for special places, cabins, cottages, vacation spots, and I write plenty of those, too. I write a lot of poems about people's dogs and cats. If I have learned nothing else over the last eight years of doing this, it is that people love their pets. But what I didn't expect was a rather intimate view of people's hopes and dreams and desires, and when they're at those crossroads or transition points that we all find ourselves in from time to time. For example, last summer, a woman came up to me and said she wanted a poem about moving back home. In two days, she was going to be moving back to her home state of Washington, and she wanted a poem to sort of mark the occasion. She had been living in various cities around the Midwest for the last several years, and she wanted a poem that would remind her of her time in the Midwest and to mark this transition that she was going to be going through. So we had a little conversation, and I asked her what she missed about Washington State. She said that she mostly missed her family, that she was really looking forward to moving back home to be close to them. She also mentioned the geography, how green it is out there, the mountains, the ocean. Then I asked her what she was going to miss about the Midwest. She mentioned a number of things here, but the thing that stuck out to me most of all was thunderstorms. She said that they just don't have thunderstorms out in Washington like we do here in the Midwest. So I took all that information and I wrote this poem. Windows. All the green you can see through the window pane of vision in your mind will welcome you. For years, the mountains of childhood rose up in you, and you could see them from the Midwest, although they were untouchable rocks that weighted you. These were bones. And there was some kind of salt water in your veins that you could taste. Now, hands reach out through the glass, and you can touch all those who you have known and who know you. You will always hear some kind of distant thunder that lives in you, but this place where you belong that you return to has windows that see inside of you. They look back and hold you with a kind of gaze that simply would not let you go. So if anybody has ever been, thank you. So if anybody's ever been in a similar situation like this, moving back home, moving across the country, you can probably read between the lines here and really make sense of what this poem is getting at. And that's one of the things I've learned about people while doing this. You know, poetry has this reputation for being so confusing and hard to understand. But what I've seen is that, for a lot of folks, poetry isn't confusing at all. Far from it. Poetry provides clarity. And the reason that it works is because the people who come up to me, they're ready for it. They're looking for some clarity. They give me an idea or a concept, and because I'm a little distant from it, and precisely because I haven't thought about it very much, I'm able to choose language that helps put things in perspective. In fact, I've had people ask me 
very, very seriously after getting their poem, are you some kind of psychic? <laughs> Other people have suggested that what I do is kind of like a bartender, handing out advice over drinks just before the last call. And a lot of times, that does feel very close to the truth. I think all literature can do this kind of a thing, but the immediacy of having a poem typed for you right there on the spot, there's a certain amount of discovery to that. Nobody is expecting to see a guy typing poems in the street with a typewriter. And when they do, for some people, they decide right then and there that maybe they need a poem. The other important thing here is that these poems are for an audience of one. Most of what we read today, either in print or online, is for a large audience, thousands of people. Think of the latest novel or blog post. Even the comments underneath that blog post could potentially get thousands of reads. The conversations that I have while doing this are between just two people, maybe three. And they might never show that poem to another person ever again. So much of what we read today is phony or inconsequential. Poetry comes from somewhere else. I've seen firsthand how this affects people. And this, I think, is the most important takeaway. That when a poem comes to life from someone's own idea, it gives that idea weight. It makes language matter. Now, while I'd like to think that most people are coming up to me because of poetry for poetry's sake, I have to admit that the typewriter itself has a pretty strong appeal. When I first started doing this, I didn't have a typewriter. So I took my laptop and a printer, hooked them up to a portable power source. It didn't work very well. People would approach me and say, you know, I saw somebody doing this with a typewriter in Chicago or New Orleans, and I thought, I have got to get a typewriter. And as soon as I did, everything changed, and people started coming up to me all the time. A typewriter is a very interesting machine in our modern world. No plugs, no wires, no backspace key, which is almost unthinkable. Although, I have had people tell me that they actually like the little mistakes I make from time to time. It makes the poem seem more real, they say. Kids have no concept whatsoever of how a typewriter even works. <laughs> they look at it the way you might expect them to look at a unicorn. They were pretty sure these things didn't exist in the world, that they were probably a myth. But now that they're confronted with one face to face, their view of everything is just completely thrown off. But they'll come up to me, and I'll give them a quick lesson in ribbon and ink and type bars. And then they've got their head right down there in the basket, <laughs> trying to figure out how the whole thing works. There's just something about typewriters and typewritten documents that appeals to people. They seem to be the perfect antidote for all of our troubles. But I don't want to give the impression that all the typing I do in the street is so serious, because I get requests for some of the strangest things you can imagine. Poems about toenails, tater tots, magic owls that can fly backwards. A man came up to me once, he was about 30 years old, completely exasperated, and he asked me, can you type me a poem about mothers who won't stop asking when they're going to have some grandchildren to play with? <laughs> and try writing that one when the mother is standing right there. <laughs> I know I'm really in for it when somebody will come up to me and say, uh, so are you writing poems? Yep, I'm writing poems. Any topic? Yep, any topic. Any topic. And that's when I know I better buckle up, because I'm in for a very interesting 10 minutes. <laughs> but the poem I want to share with you along these lines is a poem called Cheese. A guy came up to me and said, can you write me a poem about cheese? Sure, I said, why cheese? Because it's delicious, he said. <laughs> no argument there. Cheese. This yellow brick of edible wonder comes from somewhere where food rises up toward a different plane of existence. It doesn't really pass your lips. It enters somewhere inside your mind, near the place where magic tricks live. You taste it, and there is a synapse that trips. And you see carnivals and fireworks. A cow actually jumps over the moon. And for a moment, you believe you can do anything, be anything, 
planets line up and all other foods fade into nothing, well, that bite of cheese settles inside you and you fall in love with simply being alive. I want to leave you with this quote by the poet Joy Harjo. She said this, Poetry is a tool for disruption and creation, and is necessary for generations of humans to know who they are and who they are becoming in the wave map of history. The most important part of this quote is how poetry helps people to know who they are and who they are becoming. We know that this is true of music. Most people have songs that they associate with different times in their lives, and those songs remind us of who we were or who we were becoming at that time. Poetry can do this too. I know it's true for me in a poem called The Piece of Wild Things by Wendell Berry, and another poem called From Blossoms by Lee Young Lee. Cross paths with the right poem at the right time, and it can make a pretty big difference. For my own part, my hope is that the people who come up to me to request a poem will find their way to another poem, and then another, another poem, and then another poem. And who knows where that might lead? Maybe one of those people will find an old Smith Corona somewhere, and then you'll be walking down the street at a market or festival, and you'll hear that familiar hammer of type bars and that unmistakable little ding that all manual typewriters make at the end of a line. And you'll decide right then and there that maybe you need a poem too. Thanks. Thanks.